All right, so several years ago, there was this Lancet Commission on Health Professional Education, in which it basically reflected on the Flexner Report, the equivalent for the nursing profession and the equivalent for the public health profession. All these reports came out of the US a century ago. And at that time, Tulio Frank and Lincoln Chen, Tulio Frank is now the president of the University of Miami, previously at Harvard and previous to that at the WHO. And Lincoln Chen uh, is now the president of the China Medical Board, which is a Rockefeller Foundation uh, affiliate. So what they said was, look, Things have moved on. So we had Flexner that introduced science to the study of medicine and the related health professions. Then from the 80s onwards, we started to go towards a problem-based curriculum. And then now we are into the age of a system-based curriculum and a competency-based curriculum. And so they did this review, and then if you actually read their 30-page report in The Lancet carefully, uh, it has got a fairly unique perspective as to where it's actually going. So that's one thing that we have always borne at the back of our minds. The second major force, I think, that has driven things, at least at Hong Kong U, is thinking about what Ron actually ended up with. How long should the curriculum be? What kind of students should we be pulling in to the medical curriculum? Should we go with the North American model, which is exclusively and has been exclusively graduate entry for decades now? Should we go with what we have always known, which is on the far right, and that is undergraduate entry only? But even within China, and it's not just because of the special case of Hong Kong and our history, even within China, there are three-year-based curricula as well as five-year-based curricula and eight-year-based curricula. So where should we draw the line? And then, of course, there are the hybrid or the mixed models where you see mostly in the British Commonwealth where you get undergraduate entry as well as graduate medical entry um, and somewhere in between. Then the third force that I think we have to reckon with is this challenge-based education. So you may or may not be familiar with some of the names here. Uh, there is the Zeppelin School, the New School, the Olin School, and so on and so forth. So these are new universities where they have no formal curriculum. In fact, they have no classes, not even problem-based classes. They have three or four years of basically just throwing a challenge or a question to a group of three to six students, and then they go off with assistance of the professors and the tutors, and then they go, go solve it. Of course, it's very well suited to engineering and perhaps some of the other STEM specialties. Should we, could we do it for medicine? I don't know, but certainly it is something that is catching on very, very quickly. So even in some of the traditional universities like MIT, uh, you will find that they have taken elements of this challenge-based based model into their formal curriculum. And then at the bottom there is a very interesting piece. I don't know if you recognize the name Dominic Cummings. How many of you actually recognize that name? Okay, one person. But if I give you uh, his association with a movement, everybody will know who he is. He's actually the guy who is the brains behind Brexit. Uh, in fact, there is a movie about him. Uh, so he's the guy, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch actually played him in that movie. So it's a very famous movie, if you like, go watch it. But Dominic Cummings, actually, other than driving Brexit, actually is quite a deep thinker. So he wrote uh, almost like a, a manifesto of about 100 pages which he calls a blog, and it's an essay which is entitled Some Thoughts on Education and Political Priorities. If you actually read it, you will appreciate that he has thought very deeply about what university education should be about in the coming century, and it's 
a lot of food for thought. You may not agree with him entirely or even in bits, but I guarantee you, you will be inspired, either inspired to hate him or inspired by what he's written. Now, another axis. Universities the world over have been accused of nepotism, have been accused of a lot of things because of admissions. So Oxbridge, of course, the perennial targets of UK parents, UK students, and UK politicians. That's almost old news. The newest news is, of course, Laurie Lachlan having pled guilty uh, to bribing people uh, who are responsible for college ad admissions, specifically at the University of Southern California, to get her children into that college. And of course, Harvard is now still in the throes of fighting a very, very high, high stakes game of essentially affirmative action against Asian American students. And quite frankly, this whole thing is not about Asian American students. This is all about affirmative action against African, uh, 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 African American students. And if they lose this Asian American lawsuit, then the whole basis, the whole legal basis of affirmative action in favor of African Americans is going to crumble. And if you read David Willits, who used to be uh, in charge of education, he was the Secretary of State for Education of the UK government, he wrote, a very, very thick tomb uh, on what his government did in deregulating university fees and how it relates to admissions. Um, you may not agree with that particular brand of university education ethos, but again, his book will provide plenty of food for thought about university admissions and how much school fees should be. So we Finally, in Hong Kong, this is quite specific to Hong Kong, and in this country, you have the exact opposite problem. You have too many doctors. We don't have nearly enough. So the orange is actually um, the per capita number of doctors. Uh, we currently have 1.9 per thousand. OECD average is way up there, as you can see, a far cry from what we have. And green is the total number of medical graduates in Hong Kong, which corresponds to the left-hand axis. And of course, this is just telling you that we have a huge gap. Um, and the gap is indicated uh, by proportion and by total numbers. Uh, but essentially, we already have uh, a shortfall of about 500 doctors. And it's going to grow uh, to about 1,500 in the next 20, 25 years. So, with all those things at the back of our mind, what are we trying to do? Our job is to produce doctors who are ready for specialty training. That's the job of the undergraduate curriculum in Hong Kong U, and I suspect many, many other places. So essentially, we look at setting standards informed by a regulatory body, which is the Medical Council of Hong Kong, but of course, the WFME as well, which, as Ron pointed out, in Seoul, actually promulgated newer thinking about what we should expect of medical curricula. And we are already uh, talking about how to fit in to that newest thinking uh, that was discussed in Seoul just a little bit earlier. Then having got those external standards, we then formulate our own learning outcomes, and then we design the curriculum. And those examples with the fine print is just taking one set of standards and then translating them downstream. So I'm going to show you for the rest of this talk on four different major axes, and anybody who does medical education will perennially be woken up in your bad dreams by at least one or all four of these particular axes. So we start off with admissions. So at Hong Kong U, of course, like any other school, we want to recruit the best class. And what do we mean by the best? We don't necessarily mean those with the higher scores, but we take in that holistic approach like many of you. 
And we start actually in middle school through outreach and quite frankly, some of it is also marketing. But we practice a very unique blend of marketing. What we do is we actually try and dissuade students from considering medicine. So anybody who talks to me, I would spend the first half hour dissuading them and challenging them. Is medicine really for you? And it almost becomes a deductive exercise. Once they have ruled out everything else, then if they still want medicine, then I start, start talking to them about medicine. By recruiting the best class, we also want to be fair. So we reserve at least 75% of our undergraduate places to those who study in local schools and graduate from the local curriculum. And that is to avoid taking in too many people who would basically take the easier route of bypassing the local exams and then coming in with a separate set of exams that are simply not on the same uh, wavelength as the local exams. That is not localism, and God forbid, certainly not tribalism. That is in a prosperous society like Hong Kong, where we see an increasingly affluent intake, cohort after cohort after cohort, that we do not want the upper middle classes, the professional classes, and the doctors themselves self-perpetuating in sending their offsprings to the medical school. And so we make very sure that we are fair. There are public exams in Hong Kong, just like many other countries, and we make sure that everybody goes through those public exams. Otherwise, why would you have public exams? Because you do want to have a level playing field. We also have scholarships which essentially look at things other than academics, particularly those who have had fairly adverse growing up periods or growing pains, but they have recovered from them and bounced back. And we also, through the second chance scheme, that's our graduate medical entry. And, and that class uh, proportion has really gone up in the recent past. We also look at, um, the, in addition to the exam results, which is in the middle, uh, what they've done with their lives, the extracurriculars on the right, and also we assess them using this, which is the multiple mini interviews, to look at six general domains from critical thinking, abstract thinking, ethics, personal insight, general knowledge, communication skills. So every station is six minutes, everybody goes through this, four minutes for answering the questions, two minutes for moving between stations and reading the stem or the prompt. Uh, and so on, and so we have standardized scoring. So it's not just a nice chat uh, in terms of the interview. Second thing about curriculum reform. Everybody would be very familiar with this because those of us who are doctors will remember that we all went through this kind of very straight-jacketed curriculum uh, where the preclinical subjects and the clinical years would never meet. Um, that's 22 years ago uh, at Hong Kong U. From 1997 onwards, we've got an integrated curriculum where you see the mosaic of the green and the red actually starting to merge and where we move towards a hybrid PBL curriculum with longitudinal experiences. And then in 2012, the whole of Hong Kong moved from a five-year curriculum to a six-year curriculum because one year of high school has been cut, and so everybody moves towards an additional year in university. And then further, in 2017, that is two years ago, we, on account of our 130th anniversary, we launched the new, new curriculum, uh, where we have an enrichment year, and I will talk more about it, and the mosaic now becomes quite indistinguishable. So, as you can see, the six-year curriculum, we've added in quite a lot on easing that transition from high school into university, especially when the whole class is now one year younger. We've got enhanced language requirements as well as university-wide common core subjects where they have to choose subjects that's completely outside of medicine. 
um, where they have to be science literate, where they have to have a humanity subject, where they have to have global view and a mainland Chinese view. So four domains of six courses each. Then for the latest and the current curriculum, we have reshuffled the entire deck and have rewritten basically the entire curriculum from the very first year to the very last year. And in the middle, we have added an enrichment year, and I'm going to talk more about that later on. Now, the enrichment year, in theory, is there are three dimensions. For that whole year, we don't want them to have anything to do with the traditional undergraduate medical curriculum. We want them to either do some research where we want to have at least science literate medical practitioners. So they can do some research either as an attachment or actually do it for the whole year. Or they go and do service, experiential learning, humanitarian work in Africa or in rural China or in Myanmar or in some other country. And we don't just throw them out there. Of course, it's structured. They have a course on global health. Then they go and do the experiential learning and then they come back with debriefing and deliverables. Or they can go out and study something completely different. They can go to places like, they can go to Yale and study medieval history. They can go to any of these schools that you see there and study basically anything under the sun. And this is actually the colors are in proportion to the people taking up those different options for this current year, which is the first year that we have run the enrichment year class. And so here is what has actually happened since September. For the service humanitarian work, these are the places that they are working at or they have worked at, both locally and abroad. Then for the research attachment, here are some of the sample projects and some of the places that they are doing these different projects. And then finally, for the intercalation, um, We've got 116 of these students going to these different places. Um, and here you can see that some of them actually, 60 of them actually take a whole degree. Um, and then a minority, a very, very small minority, about 10, 15% of the students stay on the Hong Kong U campus but do something else. This is for the next year's class. So they have already got all their choices. And you see the numbers there show you uh, where they're going and what they're doing. Some of them do it for the full year, some of them break it up into two semesters and do one thing in one semester and something else in the other semester. And from the right to the left, we've got newer partnerships. So since we've started, we've got more of these partners and then uh, we have been constantly expanding our partner networks. So support and guidance for the enrichment year, we keep in touch with them via social media through basically two big projects. One is Project Connected, which is the Facebook-based social media platform. And then we assign a personalized mentor for each and every one of our students. Here is a three minute clip about what they have done in the past year.
screening and doing a year-long clinical attachment with the Department of Diagnostic Radiology. The research project is on cardiac magnetic resonance uh, assessment of heart failure patient with preserved rejection fraction. My name is Nicholas and I'm doing a research attachment at the Department of Medicine this year. Don't be fooled by the very nice graphics. It's one of the poorest counties in the whole of China. I'm volunteering at Amity Mutual Support Society. Hi, my name is Max, and I'm currently doing an internship with the World Health Organization. Hi, guys. So I'm now in El Salvador, the smallest country in Central America. And as you can see, I'm now on board Lobos Hope. And here is Phoebe here. <laughs> Right, so uh, it looks like a lot of fun. I'm sure that it has been a lot of fun, but there is a very, very, very steep cliff edge. How do you bring the kids back from enrichment year and then say, look, you know what? The hard life of the wards beckons. Um, you have to help them reintegrate into the class, reintegrate into the common teaching schedule, get them to be in tune with the clinical instructional mode. And of course, most of the hospital-based clinician teachers have no idea where they've been uh, and couldn't really care less. So how do you bridge that? Now, we provide steps. And these steps, of course, include an e-learning platform that is ready uh, uh, for them. We bridge it, importantly, with a series of classes and seminars on clinical reasoning. We have a modular approach, we do special interest groups in student well-being, and we help them along with personalized mentorship with academic advisors so that we can make sure that they can ease their way back into the wards. Now, I've talked a lot about the enrichment year, which to my knowledge is not been tried anywhere else before. Now, if you were running a graduate medical program, you don't need that because they already have four years of something else. We can't in our setting for various reasons. Uh, so that's what we do. But importantly, it's not just about the enrichment year. So I'm going to now focus on the very beginning block, the first semester. So how do we ease that transition from high school into the medical program, the introduction to the art and science of medicine? So we've completely revamped, and we will be introducing this come this September. Um, and we don't look at individual subjects anymore. We look at cells, tissues, and system, infection, host, and defense, drugs in action, and molecules of medicine. And each of these modules will be taught through a variety of methods, active learning, lectures, practicals, e-learning, PBL cases, uh, and basically going through all of them, we've got three key themes. One is professionalism and medicine in society, precision medicine, and clinical competencies. So all that will basically be the thread that ties all these different themes together. Another thing that we've tried to do in the last five, six, seven years is IPE, interprofessional education. And we have got three NIDUSes where we actually bring in different different disciplines together. So medical students, nursing students, pharmacy students, and Chinese medicine students in our own faculty together. One is the patient care project, another is a health research project, and the third one is actually even with students at another university, the Polytechnic University of Hong Kong, which runs the largest uh, nursing and uh, allied health profession uh, education program in Hong Kong. E-learning. So e-learning is obviously very, very important. So, oh, whoops.
why don't you sort it out and then we'll just take some questions. On behalf of the committee, we do apologize for the technical problem. So while waiting for the slide to come back, can we take a few questions from the floor um, pertaining to the last, um, to the last uh, previous uh, uh, part of the presentation? So far, do you have any questions that you want to uh, ask from the floor here? Please come up. Uh, the there, there, there are mics in the middle. I yes, think. please use the mic. Introduce yourself and where you come from. Uh, I shall sorry, I go first. <laughs> I'm Su Chen, I'm from INU. Um, thank you for such an interesting talk. And especially talking about the enrichment year. And I can see that that is in the middle of the six year curriculum, right? And all students actually go through the enrichment year. Now, um, I'm, I'm just uh, wondering, you know, uh, besides helping them to the students actually find the placements themselves, or the, in fact, or you know, the, the, the network was done by the universities, and whether the students are being sponsored by the uh, universities to those uh, countries, especially outside Hong Kong. Thank you. Very, very sensible questions of a, a medical teacher worrying about how actually this can be executed. It's an it's a enormous operation. Um, and the answer is both. So the university actually, we provide a menu for them. So there are hun literally hundreds of choices that we already have from our network of partner universities and partner programs, but we also allow them to self-initiate. So probably about two thirds, one third is the breakdown or three quarters and one quarter where the majority would be picking from the pick list that we give them. And then the rest, they actually go and do it themselves. So it's a DIY type of operation. In terms of finances, uh, most of the programs are actually uh, cost neutral to them. Uh, in terms of school fees and insurance and all that, uh, obviously uh, the airfare and the accommodation would have to be out of pocket. Now, we also run a very, very uh, robust um, sort of safety net for uh, students who may not have the means to go and do whatever they wish to do. So our, uh, our motto is we will not deny anybody any opportunity due to a lack of means. So we do apply a means test, but the means test is actually fairly generous. So we would actually pay in whole or in part, depending on uh, the financial means of the student's families. So um, it's not really an issue. But yes, we would have to have a very, very large chunk of money. In fact, we, for the first uh, sort of injection into this fund, we secured a uh, 100 million Hong Kong donation uh, as an endowment, and then we use the interest of that uh, to help students along. You can use the mic on the other side if you want. Let us know when this thing starts. I am Alan Alados from Newcastle University Medicine Malaysia. I was interested in the argument about selection of medical students and doing it equitably. So what do you do then to ensure a level playing field when it comes to the examinations and MMIs? Because presumably someone who had the means could be intensively coached in both of those two activities. So uh, for the exams, I think it's very, very difficult to judge whether somebody has been intensively coached. Um, I have a pet peeve, and that is I dislike intensely tutorial schools which seems to be all the rage in this part of the world, but particularly in Northeast Asia, including Hong Kong. Uh, that I can't help. Uh, but I mean, the, the situation is so uh, intense that several of these tutorial schools are listed companies on stock exchanges. Um, that I can't do very much about. But what I can do is to make sure that we reserve, as I said, 
the majority of the places for people who go through the same exam, and that's the local exam. Because what we've found is that a lot of the professional classes and the richer kids, they would try to avoid the local exams by going overseas or actually staying in Hong Kong, but going to a private school and then doing the international versions of one of the major exams out there, typically the IB, the A-levels, uh, or the SATs, or what have you. That's not to discount or dismiss that getting 45 out of 45 on the IB exam is a major achievement in itself. Of course it is. But given the numbers of people who sit these different exams is a tiny fraction of the local candidates, it's already actually quite generous for us to reserve 25% of the places for that. Now, for the MMIs, I'm not sure that you can be intensively coached uh, because uh, the questions are abstract um, or applied, and it's next to impossible to be intensively coached other than presentational and communication skills, that self-confidence that comes with means, quite frankly. Um, and, of course, we try to make sure that we, in our marking scheme, uh, take that into account. Thank you. Do we have it back here? No, we're not going to get this. Uh, no problem, no problem. Are we here for tea time yet? Not yet, you still have five minutes. Ah. <laughs> yeah, five minutes. Um, I'm trying to advocate on your behalf, as, as you can see. <laughs> So far, you have already uh, the first cohort is already in the fit, has already finished the previous year. Yeah, it's finishing. It's yeah. only April, so oh. in a couple more a couple more months. All right. So, um, so far, did you get any feedback from the students? How did they enjoy? It? Very good. Uh, I mean, uh, these are not edited uh, edited uh, clips. These are clips of students that they actually send back themselves. Uh, so, no, they are, as far as I can see, very, very happy. Yes, Ron. Uh, thanks. I, I greatly enjoyed your presentation. Indeed, I think it illustrated uh, in an excellent way many of the things I was talking about. A very good example, for example, of bundling the curriculum, one interpretation of that, and now you're using students. Uh, my question really is that you said that the aim of the medical school was to produce doctors ready for specialist training. Yes. And I just wonder if that really is an underestimate of what you're trying to do. Because uh, you know, that is a, seems a very simple, straightforward issue. And I think what you're really trying to do is much more than that, preparing for their own life and what sort of doctor you're training them for, for the continuing education. And I just wondered, in terms of your exit learning outcomes, I assume you've got a set of exit learning outcomes. And you know, what was very interesting, your enrichment year uh, and how does that fit in to the, the exit learning outcomes into the chart in terms of each of them? How does that year fit into the exit learning outcomes? And the clinical clerkships, how do they each meet your uh, central organization and this integration, this marvelous mosaic you showed? How does all that fit together, each subject contributing to achievement of the final competencies, learning outcomes that are expected of a Hong Kong graduate? Right. So let me just answer your first question first. You're absolutely right. So when I say that we are here really trying to just produce s graduates who are fit for specialist training, I was only referring to the professional side sure. of it. My biggest wish and my biggest objective, really, for the enrichment year is to, ha is to have them grow into an adult. That's really my biggest wish is for them to have time and space and latitude to learn to become an adult. Uh, because that, I think, is very much overlooked. And I think that that's one of the perennial deficits of an undergraduate medical curriculum in the 21st century. You could perhaps have done that 100 years ago. But I think there is this worldwide push towards a graduate medical entry scheme precisely because they find that conflating growing up in 
into an adult and that growing period and then conflating it with essentially what you showed, you know, the monkey mechanics of getting competent in clinical medicine is really not treating either realm fairly. And so what we're trying to do here is while we can't move towards totally graduate medical entry yet, we now try to get them that space and latitude to actually try new things, perhaps crash and learn in the process and then pick themselves up before they go into the wards and then basically spend the next 50 years of their lives in that same setting. And that's what we try to do. Now specifically about how we then ev evaluate is that monitoring and ev evaluation bit that you were asking in the second half of your question of the enrichment year or changing the bits throughout the entire curriculum. How do we map it to have we achieved the learning outcomes? Ah, that is what we are right now trying to do um, and trying to then say, hey, now that we have just begun this new curriculum, how are we going to do exactly what you said? Um, but work in progress. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Lim Kian Ying here from IMU. I guess you must be prepared already for the eventuality that some of them go away for that one year and decide they don't want to come back and become a doctor anymore. I would welcome that because as I told you, my philosophy in life is to dissuade people uh, and then as a, an exclusionary tactic, if they still want medicine, then I start talking to them about medicine. Especially for undergraduate medical entry and especially when we've recently cut a year off the high school curriculum and stuck it onto the university curriculum. Now you've got essentially 17-year-old kids going into the final year of high school, graduating at 18, making a decision about, as Ron said, the typical route from first-year medical school to qualified specialist is 13 years. At the age of 17, you're going to make a decision that affects 13 years of your life, basically, you've only lived 17 years. You've probably only been cognitively active for 12. And you're trying to ask this child to make a decision for the next 13 years of their lives. And so, yes, I'm very prepared that people will say, hey, this is really not for me. But I'd rather them not do it in the third year or the fourth year because it's probably a little bit too late. Uh, if we really want to help these students. Um, I've had, you know, every year I've got one or two or three out of a class of 200 some uh, who would actually drop out after the first semester or the first year. And these are not the people who don't do well. In fact, my personal experience has been in the last, I think, three years ago, I usually take the first year, first semester PBL myself. So in my group, uh, I do the end of semester in-person one-on-one -on -one evaluation. Just before Christmas, this kid who comes in, IB, 45 out of 45, okay? Comes in, superlative performance for the whole semester. Really keen, have done really well. And on the formative exam, at the end of the first semester, came in the top decile. After the whole evaluation, the doorknob comment as he was walking out, literally, when his hand was on the doorknob, uh, Professor, can I just be honest with you? Of course. Sat back down for half an hour and then poured his guts out and said, look, you know what? Would you be able to write me a reference for Harvard? I said, why? And he said, because I have always wanted to go to Harvard and I have been on the waiting list uh, still, and recently they have asked me to supply them with references because they may have a place for me. And I said, are you not happy in medicine? No, but this is really what my dad wanted me to do. I may eventually want to become a doctor, but I want to see the world first. I want to go and see the world and just do arts and sciences. And so we talked for half an hour and I said, you know what? I'm quite convinced that you will become a very good doctor if you choose to be, but you must first want to become a doctor. 
So you know what? I'm not only going to write you a letter, I'm going to ring your director of admissions for you uh, as an alum, and I will tell them that you are one of the very best that I've ever taught in 20 years at Hong Kong U. He got in, and he's very happy. Every year, he writes me a card and says, you know, thank you so much for liberating me. Uh, I may yet become a doctor, uh, but, but uh, you know, I'm so, so happy now. In the same year that he did it, uh, I lost somebody else at the end of that year to Cambridge, uh, who was admitted into Cambridge to do natural sciences, turned it down, came to us for a year, and then eventually went back. Um, and there are many, many of these uh, young people, particularly because in Hong Kong we are very protective. Mea culpa. We're very protective in our medical licensure. So basically all the people are driven into our program when they actually could have done something else first. Yes, sir. Good. I had the right button, but I was too shy. Um, Stefan from Germany. Um, <clears throat> uh, firstly, I want to congratulate you. I think this uh, kind of year, enrichment year, is, it sounds like a fantastic idea. I noticed you had a share of humanitarian work on there. Uh, I, like you, have been lucky to attend Harvard, and so I'm used to sort of seeing bubbles from the inside. Obviously, overall at Hong Kong, you're in a very privileged setup there. I was curious that the share of people doing humanitarian choices uh, was relatively low. And overall, we have uh, kind of 57 countries with massive deficiencies, healthcare workers out of which 36 are in Africa. I'm just curious if you're particularly encouraging or supporting or see opportunities for doing more of that in the future. Yes, we actually have a lot of uh, links for them in Uganda and Rwanda. Uh, and some of them do go, but if you leave free choices to students, and they are, after all, when they choose in their second year, which is 19 years old, they want to go uh, and see the rest of the global north first before they go to the global south. Uh, but as you can see, I've got a couple of students who are very happy in El Salvador. Uh, and so we do have people who go to the global south, including in mainland China. Uh, in one of the clips you saw in Yunnan province in one of the poorest counties. Uh, but yes, you're absolutely right. It's about 10% to 15% of the students would choose those experiential learning experiences. Um, uh, Dr. Hill, we have skipped the previous few, few slides. Uh, the e-learning bit. The problem with the second degree. Yes. So we have uh, put back the slide. Ah, the all right. Let me just finish. So I was going to show you some VR, AR, e-learning, what Ron talked about. But uh, e-learning being e-learning, digital stuff doesn't usually work when you want it to. So I'm sorry that the uh, fancy uh, e-learning stuff is not going to be shown. The assessment, which is very important, and you can see that there are some assessment pamphlets in your bag. So what we do is outcome-based learning, as Ron said, and we go through a very rigorous process of choosing, formulating, developing, and then really sharing questions as well. We've got a very large question bank that we share with some of your schools uh, in the audience here. But we take assessment very seriously, especially because every time Ron or somebody else comes to become our externals, the first thing they say is, wonderful, 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 but why are you still asking factual recall? So I have taken on this onerous thankless task of actually now chairing all the assessment examiners committee myself, and I pour through every single question myself with 20 other colleagues. It's a very time-consuming process, but I think it's time well spent. This is another recent innovation. So in terms of giving feedback, we actually produce now, from the first year onwards, prospectively, every time they do an exam, we give them the competencies and the learning outcome whoops, uh, that we actually want them to have. And we specify at the beginning of the semester, after the exam, we give them a traffic light.
red, yellow, or green. For, and we map all the questions to these learning outcomes and competencies, competencies so they know where they have to improve. So it's a perspective process. This just shows you the different ways that we actually evaluate students, whether it's in-class assessment, whether it's through humanities, experiential learning, whether it's through exams, whether it's through OSCEs, and so on. And this is the final summative exam of the seven different uh, clinical specialties. Now, this is very important, student well-being. These are the, the, all the things that we do. We have recently, in the last two, three years, set up a, a special unit that is kind of like a, a professional services firm where you actually set up a China wall between this unit and the rest of us, where we do common recruitment with the student societies of the student wellness counselors and the clinical psychologists and the social workers in this unit. So they have complete confidence that these are the people that they have picked together with us themselves. And these people, while paid by us, they actually do not report any of the activities that they do to us so that they retain the trust of the students and they help the students. That's their job. And the students actually have confidence in them that they are on their side. So here is the learning environment. Obviously, these are all the challenges that could rain down on students, especially students who go through this very rigorous, intensive curriculum. And then these are the things that we actually do. These are all the different programs that we do to try and sustain a good pastoral care system at the university. Because to be frank, we've seen that the resilience of some of the student cohorts that we've seen in recent years, not quite, not quite the same as what we had experienced before. That the mental health, mental wellness, sometimes even going into pathologies, and a few every year having to drop out. Those are things that we have begun to see in the last 10 years and that we are proactively addressing. And I don't think that we are alone. Now this is not to show you where Hong Kong U is ranked in terms of medical schools. This is to persuade you. If you have any sway over the major ranking agencies, please persuade them that they have to allocate a sensible proportion of their marks to education. Currently, most of it is, or about a third of it is on citations, research excellence. Then they've got employer surveys, which is really not applicable in medical education, accounting for another third. And then 30 to 40%, the bulk of it, is peer assessment by you and I. But I actually have no confidence in these peer reviewers who actually would carefully look and dissect the different curricula of the different programs offered in the different schools. And only if and when that happens will you actually get real change. Every dean, every vice chancellor is going to tell you they disregard this. Yes and no. In what we do, we probably disregard what they say, but at least the longitudinal trends and how they compare with the school next door in the same country is what we all care about, we have to care about. And governments only look at this. They won't look at curricula. And until they change, the benign or relative benign neglect of education and training and teaching and learning on university campuses is always going to play second fiddle to somebody's H index or the citations or the impact factors of the journals that their work is published in. Thank you very, very much. Looking forward to exchanging more with you over tea. Thank you, Prof. Young, for a very enlightening presentation.